Hello everyone. In this video, I will be explaining you about heme synthesis. Now in heme synthesis, there are eight reactions and all eight reactions are irreversible. There will be four reactions in this will be going on in the cytoplasm and four reactions will be going on in the mitochondria. Now let's see how exactly heme is synthesized. Heme is a complex molecule. It has got four pyrrole rings and each pyrrole rings they are holding on to one another by a methanyl bridge and each pyrrole ring has got a nitrogen and it means there are four nitrogen in the center there and they will be holding on to the ferrous siren. Now each pyrrole ring they have got two side chains and the side chains in, pyrrole, in heme molecule is methyl vinyl methyl vinyl, methyl propionate and propionate methyl. Now let's move on to see how exactly this complex heme molecule is synthesized. Now the complex heme molecule it is coming from two simple molecules and they are succinyl CoA and glycine. As you all know succinyl CoA is a TCA cycle intermediate. So whenever heme synthesis is going on this succinyl CoA is pulled out of TCA cycle and it gets into heme synthesis. It means, as you know, TCA cycle is in the mitochondrial matrix. That means very first reaction in heme synthesis should also be there in the mitochondrial matrix. Now, succinyl CoA is going to condense with the glycine molecule to make a delta amino level in it. Now, once this succinyl CoA is pulled out of TCA cycle, there will be gap in the TCA cycle. So, in heme synthesis, you are pulling succinyl CoA out of TCA cycle. So, the gap is created in the TCA cycle and that gap can be filled by some of the reactions that are going on in our body. So, those gap filling reactions are called as anaplerotic reactions. Now, what are the molecules that can provide the succinyl CoA to TCA cycle? Those molecules you can put together as vomit P. So, what is this vomit P? So, vomit P is basically it's a mnemonic for remembering the molecules that yield succinyl CoA. So, the V here is valine, branched chain amino acid valine, oxidation of valine will give you propionyl CoA, and propionyl CoA can be converted to succinyl CoA. O for odd number carbon fatty acid. Oxidation of odd number carbon fatty acid will give you propionyl CoA and that can be converted to succinyl CoA. M for methionine, ox uh, catabolism of methionine will give you propionyl CoA and that can be converted to succinyl CoA. I for isoleucine, so uh, catabolism of isoleucine will give propionyl CoA and that can be converted to succinyl CoA. T for 309, Catabolism of 309 again gives propionyl CoA that can be converted to succinyl CoA and finally P, P for phytanic acid. Phytanic acid is a branched chain fatty acid, oxidation of branched chain fatty acid in the peroxisome and then in the mitochondria later. So, it will give you propionyl CoA and that can be converted to succinyl CoA. These are some of the sources for succinyl CoA. Anyway, Succinyl CoA condensing with glycine to make delta amino level in it. This job it will be done by an enzyme called allosynthase or delta amino level in it synthase. Now this allosynthase it needs a coenzyme called pyridoxal phosphate PLP is a coenzyme for allosynthase. As you all know PLP is a co uh, active form of pyridoxine that is vitamin B6. Now, once you get delta amino level in it, this delta, so okay, before we get into the second reaction, I would like to say something about allosynthase. There are two kinds of allosynthases, allosynthase 1 and allosynthase 2. Now, allosynthase 2, it is expressed in bone marrow in all the erythroid cells or where the cells which are synthesizing red blood cells. And the gene for allosynthase 2 is on X chromosome. Whereas allosynthase 1 is present expressed in all the other cells except erythroid cells. So we have allosynthase 1 and allosynthase 2 here. 
Now the erythroid cells contribute 85% of heme synthesis that is going on in our body. Rest of the percentage like 15%. It will be going on in other tissues, but more predominantly, it will be going on in the hepatocytes because hepatocytes need cytochrome P450, which are heme-containing proteins. So, that's the importance of first reaction there and that's a regulated and rate-limiting step for heme synthesis. That's a very important step here. This is the regulated and that's a committed step. Once you get delta amino level in 8, it is going to combine with another delta amino level in 8 to make parphobilinogen and there will be release of water molecule during this time. So that means it's a dehydration reaction. So two molecules of delta amino level in 8, they will condense with one another, release water molecule and that job it will be done by enzyme called ALA dehydratase. Okay, ALA dehydratase, it's a zinc containing enzyme, it contains zinc and also ALA dehydratase, it is sensitive to lead. So this is a lead sensitive enzyme, it means lead toxicity will decrease the activity of ALA dehydratase. Now par once you get parphobilinogen here, this is the first pyrrole ring that you have synthesized. As we have seen in the previous figure, heme molecule has got four pyrrole rings. So we have synthesized one pyrrole ring here. Like this, other reaction pathways will make few more parphobilinogens. So it means you need 4 parphobilinogen to make this molecule called hydroxymethyl bilane. So parphobilinogen, 4 of them, they will condense with one another to make a hydroxymethyl bilane which is a linear molecule held with one another. Parphobilinogens are held with one another. This job it will be done by an enzyme called parphobilinogen deaminase. Parphobilinogen deaminase, which is also referred as PPG deaminase, parphobilinogen is PPG, also called as hydroxymethyl bilane synthase. So you got a linear molecule. This linear hydroxymethyl bilane, it will undergo cyclization to make a uroparphyrinogen, and that job it will be done by an enzyme called uroparphyrinogen cosynthase. Now uroparphyrinogen 3 cosynthase will make uroparphyrinogen. And also this particular enzyme, it is going to flip side chains present in the fourth pyrrole ring. So acetate and propionate, these are the side chains present in uroparphyrinogen. Uroparphyrinogen side chains, it will be acetate propionate, acetate propionate, acetate propionate and in the fourth ring there is propionate and acetate. And that flip in the ring, uh, flip in the side chains will be done by uroparphyrinogen 3 co-synthase enzyme. Once you get uroparphyrinogen, it will be converted into copropyrifenogen. During this time, there will be release of four carbon dioxide molecules. This job it will be done by an enzyme called uroparphyrinogen decarboxylase. So that gives you copropyrifenogen. How the how copropyrifenogen looks like? As you can see here in the figure, copropyrifenogen it has four pyrrole rings and the side chains in copropyrifenogens are methyl propionate methyl propionate methyl propionate and propionate methyl it means all acetyl groups in uroparphyrinogen will be converted to methyl group in four uh, uh, copropyrifenogen it means there will be release of four carbon atoms because acetyl acetate it has two carbon methyl has one carbon so acetate, all acetates are converted to methyl here. That means you have taken out four carbon dioxide because four acetates are converted to four methyl groups. That's how you got copropyrifenogen. All right, copropyrifenogen molecule will be converted into protoporphyrinogen molecule by an enzyme called copropyrifenogen oxidase enzyme. Now, what this copropyrifenogen oxidase enzyme does is it is going to convert two propionate groups in the first pyrrole ring and the second pyrrole ring into vinyl group. Propionate is a three carbon compound, vinyl is a two carbon compound. Two propionate molecules are converted to two vinyl molecules. That means there will be release of two carbon dioxides here. That's how you get protoporphyrinogen. Now the protoporphyrinogen, it will be converted into protoporphyrin by an oxidation process done by protoparphyrinogen oxidase. 
And once you get protoporphyrin, so this protoporphyrin will be converted to heme molecule by incorporating ferrous iron into the center of porphyrinogen molecule and that job it will be done by ferrochelatase enzyme. So this is how you synthesize heme molecules. So there are eight reactions and there are eight enzymes in heme synthesis. Four reactions are going on in the mitochondrial matrix and four of them will be going on in the cytoplasm. Okay, once you synthesize heme molecules, so especially for uh, heme, oh, sorry, in uh, other uh, cells, other than the erythroid cells, say in hepatocytes and other cells, this heme molecule, it has got a negative feedback, negative effect on allosynthase enzyme. Especially allosynthase 1 enzyme, uh, ALAS1 enzyme feedback negatively modulated by heme molecule. So heme molecule it acts at various steps. It has got a classic feedback negative effect. It is going to inhibit transport of allosynthase from the cytoplasm into the mitochondrial matrix because this is located in the mitochondrial matrix. It decreases the translation of allosynthase. It, in, it represses allosynthase gene overall when you have sufficient heme it makes sure that heme synthesis decreases. Whereas the allosynthase 2 which is present in the erythroid cells it is controlled entirely by the availability of iron that is the ferrous iron is the one which is required for heme synthesis. So the availability of iron is the one which will control allosynthase 2 enzyme. And also note that allosynthase 1 enzyme especially in the hepatocytes they are induced by that particular enzyme is induced by several drugs like barbiturates or phenytoin, phenobarbiturate. So, several group of drugs that they can induce allosynthase 1 because these drugs are metabolized by cytochrome P450s and cytochrome P450 in turn it's a heme containing protein that means to synthesize cytochrome P450 you need allosynthase and all these reactions. That is why the drugs they will, in, uh, they will induce allosynthase 1 thereby more and more heme can be synthesized thereby it helps in cytochrome P450 synthesis. And also note that pyridoxal phosphate is a coenzyme for allosynthase. Availability of pyridoxal phosphate that is vitamin B6 is important for heme synthesis. Whenever there is a deficiency of vitamin B6 that can give rise to decrease in heme synthesis giving rise to microcytic hypochromic anemia. Nutritional status also plays an important role in regulation of heme synthesis. When person is in fasting and starvation during that time there will be increase in the activity of allosynthase especially allosynthase 1 activity will be increased during fasting and starvation. Whereas if feeding of carbohydrate diet especially the glucose feeding of or in, uh, infusion of glucose decreases or it, uh, represses allosynthase enzyme activity that because it works by PPAR alpha receptors that is peroxisome proliferated activated receptor alpha is mediated action will make sure that allosynthase activity decreases by silencing the gene responsible for allosynthase. That means feeding of carbohydrates especially glucose it decreases the activity of allosynthase whereas fasting and starvation increases the activity of allosynthase. These are some of the regulatory points related with allosynthase. Now coming with the disorders that are associated with um, heme synthesis. So the congenital disorders that are associated with heme synthesis they are called as porphyrias. So there are different types of porphyrias that you can see here because each enzyme deficiency can give rise to a disorder. If there is a defect in the gene coding for allosynthase that can give rise to allosynthase enzyme deficiency. If there is a defect or deficiency in allodehydratase, allodehydratase enzyme deficiency can give rise to a decrease in heme synthesis. If there is a de de deficiency or defect in porphobilinogen deaminase enzyme, that can give rise to a disease called acute intermittent porphyria. In acute intermittent porphyria, patients will have abdominal pain, neuropsychiatric uh, disorders like depression, anxiety, hallucination, and they don't show any photosensitivity. Coming with the other disorder, europarphyrinogen 3 co-synthase enzyme deficiency that can give rise to a disease called congenital erythropoietic porphyria. In congenital erythropoietic porphyria, there will be hemolysis, photosensitivity can be seen, but these patients, they don't show any abdominal pain. 
and uroporphyrin was a decarboxylase enzyme deficiency it can give rise to a disease called porphyria cutanea tarda this is the most common type of porphyria patients will have severe photosensitivity and there won't be any abdominal pain here so photosensitivity and uh, dermatological issues increase facial hair these are the things that can be seen with porphyria cutanea tarda which is the most common type of porphyria so and other disorders that is variegate porphyria, coproporphyrias, all these other disorder uh, porphyrias can also be seen with the other enzyme deficiencies here. One of the things that I would like to say here is in most of the porphyrias, so the patient will excrete red colored urine. Why? Because porphyrinogens are colorless molecules whereas porphyrins, oxidation product of porphyrinogen is a porphyrin and porphyrin is a color, red colored molecule. So, if there is a say in this particular disease here, uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase, if this enzyme is deficient or decreased, so there will be accumulation of this uroporphyrinogen molecule and this uroporphyrinogen, it will be oxidized into uroporphyrin and this uroporphyrin, it can lead to basically it can interact with reactive oxygen species, molecular oxygen, convert that into reactive oxygen species and can damage the skin and also it will appear in the urine. So, urine color will change red. So, presence of uroporphyrin, uroporphyrinogen is a colorless molecule, uroporphyrin is a red colored molecule. So, porphyria patients, they excrete red color urine. And also there are two enzymes in heme synthetic pathway which are sensitive to lead. One is ala dehydratase enzyme, lead sensitive enzyme and the other is ferrochelatase enzyme, this is a lead sensitive enzyme. It means in lead toxicity these two reactions can be affected that means there will be elevation of delta amino levulinate and also there will be elevation of zinc protoporphyrin 9 molecule. Why? Because lead is going to dip, displace the zinc present uh, attached to the allodeatase by replacing that zinc. So, this zinc it can go and bind to protoporphyrin and become zinc protoporphyrin. So, in lead toxicity, there will be elevation of delta aminal levulinate and zinc protoporphyrin in the blood, along with there will be microcytic hypochromic anemia decrease in the electron transport chain because even heme is required for cytochromes present in electron transport chain. There will be basophilic stippling in the red blood cell which is another feature of lead toxicity. So, there will be other neurological signs seen in lead toxicity. These are all the reactions and some of the applied aspects related with the lead toxicity, uh, sorry, related with uh, heme synthesis. So, I hope this video has helped you in understanding uh, or revising heme synthesis process and all the enzymes involved in this. Thanks for watching.